Haswell E was the first CPU series to launch on the X99 platform, and it boasted a lot of firsts. First Intel platform to support DDR4, first consumer-oriented 8-core 16-thread CPU, first socket name that raised more questions than it answered. The most perplexing innovation among the Haswell HEDT chips, however, was Intel's highly advanced methods of alienating customers. In 2014, SLI and Crossfire were still a thing, just. The buying public were perhaps getting wise to the fact that it often didn't work as expected, and that using multiple GPUs for gaming was mostly a pointless flex. Standard desktop CPUs at the time, like the i5-4570 and i7-4770, supported 16 PCI Express lanes, just enough for one full bandwidth graphics card. Any further use of PCIe devices would inevitably take bandwidth away from the main graphics card, and that included installing a second GPU. Owners of conventional desktop platforms could only run dual GPUs at times 8 PCIe speeds. For the most part, this was pretty academic. I've tested relatively high end GPUs from this era at both times 8 and times 16, and seen almost identical benchmark scores. Plus, SLI on Crossfire rarely gave perfect performance scaling anyway. But the PC industry will always cater to people who want the best, regardless of whether or not it makes sense. HEDT platforms had held the solution to that very niche first world problem. X58 handled 36 lanes of PCI Express on the motherboard chipset. X79 moved PCIe duty to the CPU, but every Core i7 and the majority of Xeons on this socket supported 40 lanes. For the new X99 platform, Intel decided to change this again, and added a new layer of market segmentation for no good reason. The i7-5930K and 5820K were identical CPUs in pretty much every respect, bar one. The cheaper chip supported just 28 PCIe lanes. This was fine for most people. You could run a GPU at x16 and still have room for three more times four or one times four and one times eight device on the bus, more than enough for a PCIe add-in board or NVMe SSD. What you couldn't get was two x16 devices running at full speed. How much would Intel charge to regain this privilege they'd taken away? Oh, just 50 percent. In fairness, the i7-5930K wasn't a drop in value at all. It cost the same as the Ivy Bridge E predecessor, the i7-4930K, yet benefits from the newer architecture, DDR4 and AVX2 support, plus a 15 megabyte cache that brings it more in line with the previous generation's top-end Extreme Edition chips. The thing is, the i7-5820K was $400, or $200 less than the 5930K, and to labour the point, it's exactly the same CPU in every other specification. Some people argue that the 5930K was better binned, potentially meaning higher overclocks, but I think that's more of an assumption than anything that was officially stated, and 4.5GHz OCs like the one I'm running don't seem unrealistic on either chip. If you're interested in buying an i7-5930K based on the following review, and don't mind missing out on some PCIe lanes, you can pretty much treat the 5820K as the same CPU. Unless you want to run SLI, itself a dubious prospect in 2023, you shouldn't pay over the odds to get this chip over the i7-5820K. Today's test platform is a Gigabyte X99 with 32 gigs of DDR4-4000, running at 3200CL16 in quad channel. First generation DDR4 platforms don't tend to run RAM at high speeds, and this was as high as I could get mine to run. The CPU is being cooled by a 240mm Cooler Master AIO, and the GPU, as always, is a Gigabyte RTX 3070. Talk about a strong start, Valorant clocks up an impressive 280 FPS on average on the 5930K. Previous Gen 6 cores like the 3960X only managed about 200 FPS at the same clock speeds. Most people don't have 240Hz monitors, so saying only 200 FPS is a bit ridiculous, but it can be easy to get carried away when benchmarking these things. Still, whether it's down to the extra IPC or the AVX2 instruction set, this is a superb result.
And if that was impressive, wait till you see Battlefield 5. The Haswell E-Chip sees a more than 50% increase in average FPS from the Sandy Bridge 3960X and a frankly silly increase in 1% lows. In fact, barring the occasional scene transition, I don't think I remember experiencing any major stutter at all. I suspect that AVX2 is the main reason why Haswell chips I've tested so far run this game so much better than the previous generation. Fortnite has its own stuttering issues, and as yet I don't think a hardware cure has been found. The 5930K still sees an admirable jump in averages from previous generation CPUs into the ballpark of a 240Hz high refresh display, though 1% and 0.1% lows might spoil that experience somewhat. Compared to newer 6 cores, it's still a long way off, but I'd say this is still pretty impressive for a 2014 CPU. Microsoft Flight Simulator is a little rough going. Flying over NYC, one of the more intensive parts of the world for both the CPU and GPU, averages come in just above 51,000 feet. If you've got yourself a nice high-performance GPU to experience some of the prettiest graphics around, then you can have a decent experience in Flight Sim using this platform, but you're not likely to hit 60 FPS that often. I haven't got around to testing newer CPUs as yet, but I have a feeling something like an i5-12400 or Ryzen 5 5600 would do better here. Spider-Man Remastered's version of Manhattan is a bit smaller than the Flight Sim version, but the details are a damn sight better. Performance is too, as at 1440 very high with DLSS quality, FPS averages around 99, pretty much even with the 8-core 5960X and a healthy 20% above the old 3960X. Turning on RT can still cripple the frame rate, with averages down to a still healthy 61 FPS, but with 1% lows in the mid 30s. Cyberpunk 2077 remains extremely playable on the 5930K, though the generational leap coming from the 3960X isn't as big as we've seen elsewhere. This CPU can manage 68 FPS on average at ultra settings without RT, up from the older CPU's 65. For my RT test, I dropped the render resolution a little further using DLSS balanced instead of quality, and now the difference between the CPUs opens up ever so slightly. The 5930K is over 10% faster than the 3960X, averaging 55 FPS to the older CPU's 49. Red Dead Redemption 2 enjoys a pretty sizeable bump in performance from this chip when compared to the 3960X. I run my usual test at 1440 DLSS quality, or about 1706 by 960 render resolution, with the quality slider set to the lowest preferred quality position. On this chip, that results in a near 87 FPS average, only a few frames slower than the 8 core flagship, but a healthy 10 FPS upgrade from the previous gen 6 core CPUs. Haswell E is threatening to make Elden Ring a obsolete benchmark at this point, though there's still enough of a drop in 1% and 0.1% on the 5930K to be noticeable. Averages are still as near to the 60fps cap as to be indistinguishable, but frames do occasionally drop, meaning 1% lows of 47. I don't claim to be an expert on Civ 6, but based on previous testing, the 5930K's 6.8 second average turn time looks pretty competitive to me, being a quarter of a second faster than the 3960X, and only an eighth of a second slower than the 8-core 5960X. Having recently tested this CPU's bigger brother, I have mixed feelings about recommending the 5930K. On the one hand, it's a great performer at a good price. The going rate on eBay in the UK right now is £35 to £40, about half the price of the 8-core model. That being said, the aforementioned 5820K is slightly cheaper at around £30, 
and in some regions you might be able to get the almost identical Xeon E5 1650v3 for even cheaper than that. The bigger problem is the overall platform cost. Used X99 boards from major brands cost in excess of £100, and at this point it's actually competing against some low-end Ryzen's brand new. The extra £35 or so for a 5960X might look pretty appealing, especially if you also want to use the PC for more intensive productivity tasks. That being said, if you can get a great deal on a motherboard or a whole system, or you have one already and wanted to know if it was time to upgrade yet, I think you can rely on the 5930K for at least a little while longer yet. which seems like as good a time as any for me to call time on Haswell E. The only other chips within this architecture are either variations on the 5930K or 5960X, or they're multi-socket chips that can be found with many, many more cores and bigger caches, but which trade off in terms of clock speeds. While 14, 16, even 18 core CPUs from this generation might still have their uses in certain workloads, from a gaming perspective, I think they're overkill. My next X99 review will be from the next architecture in line, Broadwell E. In the meantime, here's my review of the 5960X in case you missed it. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.